Hello everyone and welcome back again to the linear algebra component of the calculus and linear algebra series. In the previous video we introduced this idea of the set of complex numbers, that was we extended the set of real numbers to this larger set, the set of complex numbers, using the imaginary unit we introduced in an earlier video, and we saw by doing so that allowed us to produce solutions to any quadratic equation we could be given. And towards the end of the video we also discussed about what it meant to talk about the real and imaginary parts of complex numbers as well as whether or not two complex numbers were equal or not. And what I haven't so far addressed is I haven't so far kind of discussed what the physical meaning of these complex numbers are or how can we think of them in this geometric way that I've emphasized a lot in the previous videos. So recall we had this perspective that we could take on the real numbers, that we can think of the real numbers acting on the real number line in this additive way or multiplicative way. That is, we could think of numbers in either this shifting action of either left or right, or this stretching action or squishing action, depending on if we thought of them in this additive or multiplicative way. And we want to use this similar picture to kind of get a geometric idea of what the imaginary unit is and in turn other complex numbers or all complex numbers. So let's go to our first kind of animation we've got here or I've constructed. So I want to think about the multiplicative action of i. So what I've got here is I've written out kind of the number line. This you can think of as the real number line and the green dots I've put on the right hand side are just where the positive integers are and the red dots are where the negative integers are. And what I want to do is I want to bring up this idea, right, that we've got i, we've introduced it as the imaginary unit and it's defined in such a way that i times i is equal to minus 1. And if we look at the right-hand side of this equation, minus 1, well, we saw what minus 1 we could think of uh, as like in this multiplicative way. If we thought minus of minus 1 in a multiplicative way, we saw what it did to the number line. In other words, it rotated the number line by 180 degrees. So minus 1 we could think of as this action. It just simply rotated the number line by 180 degrees. So let's start back at the beginning, let's kind of restore this and think, kind of look at the left hand side. Well, let's recall that when we were looking at the multiplicative action and we looked at, for example, the 2 times 2 equals 4 case, what that meant was that a stretch by a scale factor of 4 was the same as two stretchings by scale factors of 2. In other words, whatever the number that we've written down, whatever that represents or however it transforms the number line, Doing it twice was the same as whatever it was on the other side of the equal sign. So what this is saying here is that if we've got i times i equals minus 1, that on the right-hand side we think of minus 1 as a rotation by 180 degrees. And if we do i, whatever i is, and we think of as our kind of transformation to our number line, if we do that twice, that is the same as rotating by 180 degrees. Well, it's not that much stretch of an imagination to think, well, maybe we should think of an i then as a rotation by 90 degrees. So the action of i, or we think of i acting on the real number line in this multiplicative way, as simply rotating the whole real number line by 90 degrees. In other words, i, the imaginary unit, and in turn all the imaginary numbers, lie in an axis that is perpendicular to the normal real number line. So we have a kind of another number line, the imaginary number line, that lies perpendicular to the real number line. And we can easily check, right, that if we do another action of i here, if we think of another action of i, it's another action of 90 degrees, indeed we see that two actions of i here exactly corresponded to minus 1. So this geometric picture is extremely intuitive, right? And it allowed us to think of now our where does i live on our real number line? Well, it doesn't seem to live on a real number line, but it lives in another axis perpendicular to our real number line. And that leads us to this concept, otherwise known as the Argand diagram or complex plane, which I've drawn as the following. So here notice we have kind of our axis going along uh, the x-axis. It's got the real numbers on. We're thinking of this as the real number line. And this kind of vertical axis, the y-axis here, has got our imaginary uh, numbers on. So we kind of think of this as our imaginary number line. And we see in this very intuitive way that we thought of it as that the imaginary number line lies perpendicular to the real number line. That's exactly how we saw that, this, this picture. Okay, so what I want to do now is let's look at a couple of points on this number line. Let's look at a couple of the points here on the real number line and think about how I, the imaginary unit, would act upon them and see if it's consistent with our, with our picture. So we've just talked a minute ago that we want to think of I in the multiplicative way 
how it acts on the real number line is by rotating the real number line by 90 degrees. That is, that I acts in a multiplicative way on the real number line by rotating things by 90 degrees. So if it acts on 1, it rotates 1 by 90 degrees, and indeed that takes us to 1 times i, so that makes sense. What about if we take another number, let's say 3? What would i do when it acts on 3? What would 3 times i give us? Well, 3 times i exactly takes the number 3 and simply just rotates it by 90 degrees into our imaginary um, number line. So this seems to be making a lot of sense. Uh, let's take another number here. We can take a negative integer on our real number line. What would happen if we multiply it by i? Well, that would simply rotate it by 90 degrees, and that takes it down to minus 2i, right? So i here, this imaginary unit that was this rather abstract thing that we invented purely as solving polynomial equations, is in this situation, it's nothing more than just acting on real numbers and rotating them by 90 degrees. But further, we can even act it on other complex numbers, or we can even act it on other imaginary numbers. So take a, a number like 3i here, what would be i acting on 3i, that would be again just rotating it by 90 degrees. In other words, that takes it down to minus 3. So we can think of that as 3i times i, it's like 3i squared, which is minus 3. So the action of i on at least what we've got here for imaginary numbers and real numbers on our complex plane simply just rotates those numbers by 90 degrees. It's not a particularly kind of complex or imaginary concept. All it is is talking about rotating numbers across a plane now rather than just a line. But let's just look or kind of extend it more generally here. So what I've done in this animation is I've got the green line here is representing the whole real number line and the uh, red line is, is representing the imaginary number line. And if I act I on, the, on these two number lines, what does it do? It simply just rotates these number lines by 90 degrees. In other words, our final transformation, when we think about I, what is that? What do we think I as? Well, we think of how it transforms the number line um, or the two number lines now, the imaginary number line and the real number line in this multiplicative way. You see here that it rotated the red number line by 90 degrees and the green number line by 90 degrees, so they flipped. So let's return back. And then the next question that we might want to ask is, we might want to say, well, we've thought of how the complex numbers act in this multiplicative way, right? They act by rotating numbers by 90 degrees. Well, that's how the imaginary unit acts. That's so far what we've deduced, that we think of the imaginary unit as simply rotating stuff by 90 degrees. But what about in the additive way, right? We also had this other interpretation of how the real numbers acted on the number line by shifting them left and right. Right? They weren't just about stretching. So we've got the, the imaginary unit we know acts in a multiplicative way by rotating things by 90 degrees. How will it act in an additive way? So let's take the number here 1 on the real number line and we want to take here i, so we're thinking here of how i acts on the number 1. So how should we think of um, i acting on 1 in an additive way? In other words, all it does is it shifts it by one unit up. So whereas before we had the, the we could think of the real numbers as acting on the real number line by shifting them left and right, in this case we think of our imaginary numbers as acting on the real number line by shifting them up and down. So as you might expect again, let's continue here with the number one, but take another different complex or a different um, imaginary number here. And how would this, how would we interpret 3i in an additive way acting on the real number line? It simply just shifts that number up by three units. It makes a lot of sense. Let's take another example. What if we took here um, minus 2i acting on the number minus 2? This would give us the number shifted down by 2. So much like how we thought about numbers as shifting actions, we thought of real numbers as shifting actions left and right in this additive way, we think of complex numbers, or in this term imaginary numbers, as shifts up and down depending on... Um, the sign of this imaginary number. And that's how we think of it in an additive way. And we can also do this, or we can extend this. So here, now I've got my entire real number line, and I've described um, that I've written, I've kind of put that in the color green. And we've got this yellow dot here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this yellow dot up and down, and wherever this yellow dot lies on the imaginary number line, that is what it's going to, you know, that with whatever that number that it lies on is going to be the one that it transforms the green line by, in other words, the real number line. So as it kind of moves up here, we see as it kind of transitions up, it ends up here at, say, 3.5.
that means that we're thinking of the number 3.5i as how it acts on the real number line in an additive way, that is it shifts the whole real number line up by 3.5 units. And restoring it back to the beginning and going the opposite direction, if we kind of drag down, what that's telling us is that each of these numbers that the yellow dot lies on, that's telling us how that would transform the real number line. So at the end here it's at minus 3.5, in other words it transforms the real number line by shifting it down by 3.5 units. But similarly, because there's a symmetry to this, instead we could take the imaginary number line and think about how the real numbers act on the imaginary number line. And they're going to act in the same way that they acted on themselves, that they acted on the real number line. So the real number line acted on itself in an additive way by shifting things left and right. So in this situation, my yellow dot now represents the number that it would be on the real axis. So whatever number it lies on is going to tell you how it's going to transform the imaginary axis. In other words, we've got here that it lies on the number 6, and it shifts the imaginary axis along by 6 units to the right. And similarly, going in the negative direction, wherever the yellow dot lies, that tells me how it's going to be shifting the um, imaginary axis to the left. So this makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, we're just really understanding our imaginary numbers as, in a multiplicative way, as something that just rotates things by 90 degrees. At least this is just for the imaginary unit, that it just rotates things by 90 degrees. We haven't talked about the other imaginary numbers yet, how they act multiplicatively. We will see that in a future video. But we have seen how they act additively as well. They just act by shifting things up and down. So in other words, how can we think of as a point, what is a point on this plane, on this kind of complex plane? Well, this point here, we can think of as z equals 2 plus 3i. In other words, it's just a complex number. You might have wondered when we introduced complex numbers, at least the set of them, why we had this thing plus. What did plus even mean, right? Because we've got an imaginary number and a real number. 2 is the real number and 3i is the imaginary number. How can we add these two things together? It, it doesn't seem to make sense because I can only add together two real numbers. But we see here that this thinking of add here in this kind of transformational way in terms of shifting along our axis gives us a kind of really nice geometric picture of what 2 plus 3i means. It simply means if we start at 0, let's go 2 units along, that's what we mean by this 2 in the real part, so that's the real part of z here. So if we start with kind of at the centre, that means we move 2 along because we shift 2 to the right because it's plus 2. And then we've got a plus 3i, in other words, wherever we ended up from 2, we shift it up by 3 units, right? Because that's what we thought of as plus 3i. Doing a plus an imaginary number meant shifting up however many units that imaginary number had. But equally speaking, we could think of it the other way, right? Kind of restoring this picture, we could instead think of it as taking an additive action of 3i from 0. In other words, that means shifting that thing up by 3 units and then taking an additive action from on 3i by 2. So in other words, that means shifting it to the right by 2 units. And that means that we end up at this point. So in other words, we've got kind of a really nice representation of how to describe our complex numbers that we introduced in the previous video that we had in this form of x plus iy. We actually realise this is nothing more than just points and vectors on a two-dimensional plane. We'll in fact see that there's a deep connection between this and, and linear algebra in some kind of future videos. And here I've just got a kind of simple name that I've just highlighted here. So um, we call this axis that I've highlighted in, in yellow here the imaginary axis. Um, and it's sometimes denoted by im or imz to, to mean imaginary. And the horizontal axis, the x-axis, as you might expect, is otherwise just known as the real axis that I've highlighted in yellow here. But We've seen now that actually if we can represent complex numbers as kind of points on this complex plane, we don't necessarily need to describe them via this kind of x and y coordinate. We could describe them in other ways. And this leads us to this idea of what is known as the polar form of a complex number. So here I've got kind of another complex plane, but I haven't written any units on because we don't want to think of these kind of square boxes going along as one, two, three. We're just, we're just leaving it general now. And I've written this uh, im on the y-axis to say that's the imaginary axis, and re on the horizontal axis to mean that that's the real axis. So let's take a general point in this space. I've got as this kind of yellow dot. And I'm going to take that and just call that z equals x plus i y. Right. So in other words, it's x units in the uh, horizontal direction and y units in the vertical direction. 
We can think of that again as this shifting action horizontally and shifting vertically by uh, uh, Y units. This kind of ties together this geometric picture with complex numbers. And complex numbers are nothing more than just geometry of the two-dimensional plane in this situation. So uh, we can describe that by this kind of vector here coming out from the origin. And the distance from the origin to this point is simply just given by Pythagoras' theorem. In other words, r squared here is x squared plus y squared. So we can write r, this kind of radius, we're thinking of it as, as the square root of x squared plus y squared. And projecting kind of down to the x-axis and similarly projecting along to the y-axis with these kind of red and green lines. And similarly, we can write down a nice angle here, theta. We realize we've got some very simple right angle triangles and we can describe what the x coordinate is in terms of r and theta, right? In this situation, the x coordinate is simply r cosine theta, just using some simple trigonometry from, um, from school. And similarly, we can see that the y component is just r sine theta. So in other words, we can write z as r cosine theta plus i sine theta. And this is what is known as the polar form of a complex number. So it's generally referred to, if we write it in the x plus i y form, as a Cartesian form of the complex number. And in this form, it is known as the um, uh, polar form. But we see here we've got a couple of definitions to run through. So the r term is often referred to as the modulus of z and is donated by this kind of modulus sign that you've seen before. Um, and it's just simply describing the distance away from the origin on the complex plane. And similarly, we've got here the angle theta is referred to as the argument of z and is donated by this arg of z. And we specifically take its domain to be between minus pi, not including minus pi, and pi. So we're using this in this standard like clope and set notation that we've introduced in a previous video. So this is important, notice, because I've got different quadrants of my, of my plane that I'm looking at here. And I could, there's kind of a redundancy in describing the points of that plane with theta, right? Because I could always wind round infinitely, infinitely many times around the circle. I could go in different directions. I could have gone in the opposite rather than going, let's say, uh, anti-clockwise from the real axis. I could have gone clockwise from the real axis. And generally the convention is that we take theta to be positive if we're going in a anti-clockwise direction from the real axis and it's taken to be negative if we're going in a clockwise direction from the real axis. And we define it in such a way that it's the kind of top half of the plane is between 0 and 180 degrees or pi radians and the bottom half is between 0 and minus pi radians or minus 180. But if it, for example, we take the number like minus 1 that lies on the negative part of the real number line, that would have an argument of pi because that's what we include. We're including pi as our 180 degrees and not minus pi. But we'll see this in more detail in a future video when we look at some examples of how to describe complex numbers, various complex numbers, in different portions of the plane. And you'll see how intuitive this is just using some simple uh, geometry or Euclidean geometry that you've done in school. So that's where we're going to conclude the video. Hopefully this has given you an idea now of kind of a more geometric intuition of what a complex number, or at least what the imaginary unit is, how it acts on the real number line in a multiplicative way. That was, we saw that it simply just described rotations of 90 degrees and how the imaginary numbers also acted on the real number line in an additive way. That was, they just shifted the real number line up and down by however many units we described on the, on the imaginary axis. And similarly, we could have also thought of the imaginary axis translating left and right by thinking of the real numbers acting on the imaginary numbers in an additive way. So there's this very intuitive geometric picture behind the complex numbers. And they were kind of the story that we came from is we invented them as a necessity to solutions to polynomial equations. They were extremely abstract. The square root of minus one, you would say, doesn't really exist. But by thinking of numbers, in this geometric and kind of transformational way, how they act on themselves or act on the number line in this transformational property led to an extremely intuitive idea of the complex numbers as simply extending our real number line to basically a number plane. And by doing that, that actually allowed us to solve all these polynomial equations, including quadratic equations and even higher order equations when we talk about things like the fundamental theorem of algebra, which is, is quite remarkable. So. As I say, that's where we're going to conclude. And in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to look about how 
we're going to discuss the additive action of all complex numbers on the um, other complex numbers on the plane because so far all we've discussed is how the imaginary numbers act on the real number line and how they act on themselves effectively just by shifting the real number line up and down or shifting themselves up and down just up and down the real number line up and down the imaginary number line but we don't know given any two arbitrary complex numbers how do they act on each other but hopefully you can kind of think about this for yourself before that video about what's the geometric way of taking say two complex numbers z and w and thinking what it means to do z plus w how can we think of that geometrically so that's what we'll address in the next video and in the future videos we'll start to look at other complex num you know how can we multiply two general complex numbers because so far we've just discussed how to multiply the real number line by the imaginary unit and we saw that that just is interpreted as a rotation by 90 degrees but we also want to see what if we take other imaginary numbers even like 2 times i or 3 times i and even further what if we take a general number like 2 plus i and multiply that by another complex number how can we interpret that so we'll address that in future videos and i remind you to to read the notes after this video and also attempt any problems in the module handbook pertaining to this the content of this video so thanks very much for watching and see you in the next video